Hello, I'm Professor Rich and this is TYT History. Today I want to talk about Cinco de Mayo and why you should care about what it is uh, if you care about American history. Uh, first off, I think most people have no idea what Cinco de Mayo is. I think if you asked people, the two answers you would get would be I don't know and Mexican Independence Day. Uh, forgive my pronunciation throughout this uh, video because I don't speak Spanish, but Mexican Independence Day is actually the 16 de septiembre, uh, which is the September 16th. Um, which is the day they actually win their independence from Mexico, uh, from Spain, excuse me, back in 1821. Um, today, I think to most Americans, Cinco de Mayo is an excuse to go out and drink Mexican beer, uh, not this year, but usually in the middle of the week, uh, which, of course, we like. What Cinco de Mayo really is, is a celebration of a victory of a, a, a group of Mexicans over a French army in a city called uh, Puebla, uh, way back in 1862. Now, here's why it matters. What's going on at the time is uh, Mexico, uh, under Benito Juarez, has suspended the payment of, of interest on their debt to their European creditors, uh, particularly the United Kingdom, Spain, and France. Spain actually invades Mexico and seizes Veracruz uh, on the Mexican coast in 1861 and begins collecting the customs duties to pay themselves back because Mexico isn't paying them back. Uh, France, under Napoleon III, this is the Second French Empire, not Napoleon Bonaparte, but Napoleon III, uh, will decide they're going to invade Mexico, seize control of the whole thing, uh, under the name of paying themselves back the money that's owed them, as well as paying the United Kingdom and, and Spain. And under the name of free trade, uh, Europe argues that America has created a monopoly over trade uh, in the Western Hemisphere. And one thing you may not be aware of is that America was kind of the China of the, of the 19th century. And here's what I mean by that. America back in the day was this up-and-coming economic superpower that everybody knew was about to be competing with the big boys and was very likely to overtake everybody. And so while we were friendly and we did a lot of business with Europe, they had a, a certain degree of paranoia about the future of America and the potential we had to make a lot of money. And so the big economic powers in Europe were always looking for an opportunity to cut into America's markets uh, and compete with us in some way. And so they saw this opportunity in Mexico as a way to do that. Now, the reason they hadn't done something like this before was because in 1823, President James Monroe had issued the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, this was written, incidentally, by John Quincy Adams, who was Secretary of State at the time. The Monroe Doctrine said uh, that, that this half of the world... Um, we'll take care of it, and Europe needs to stay out of it. We declared the Western Hemisphere as off-limits to European intrusion. We didn't claim necessarily that we owned it or that it was our empire we were going to take it over, just that we would handle any problems that happened over here. And so, officially, we had uh, threatened Europe if they came over here and got involved in Western affairs. So why did they come over here in, 1860, uh, in the 1860s and begin to do this? Well, obviously because we were distracted. The Civil War was going on, and so the European countries felt... Uh, that they could come over here and get involved. So, for, so Spain has seized Veracruz, but then France announces their intention to take the whole country of Mexico, and Spain withdraws and allows France to attempt this. Uh, France will arrive in Veracruz with an army of 8,000 highly trained, highly equipped men. In fact, the French army was considered by many at the time to be the greatest army in the world. And they'll, ta they'll take Veracruz from the Spanish and begin marching up the road to Mexico City to seize the capital. Now, on the way in, in the city of Puebla, they will meet a Mexican army of 4,000 men who are uh, relatively poorly equipped and poorly trained. And then something of, an, of a military miracle will happen. The, the, the Mexican army will repulse uh, 8,000 uh, French soldiers at Puebla. Um, now, this will lead to this uh, huge feeling of nationalism in Mexico. Is it, it is something of a David and Goliath thing. And is celebrated uh, heavily in Puebla to this day where it occurred. But, of course, this was just a one-time thing. The French army is going to regroup and by 1863 uh, is going to take Mexico City and install a dictator, uh, Maximilian I. Now, when the Civil War ends... America is able to turn their attention to this intrusion into our half of the world as we see it under the Monroe Doctrine. We, uh, uh, President Andrew Johnson, who I bet you never hear anything good about, uh, is going to send uh, 50,000 troops under the command of U.S. Grant uh, to the Mexican border, uh, where they will station themselves there clearly as a threat to France. We will then use our Navy to blockade Mexico uh, uh, to try to drive the French out. With this U.S. assistance, the Mexicans are going to be able to drive the French out by 1867 uh, and, and win their freedom for a second time. 
Incidentally, this is the last land invasion of any country in the Western Hemisphere by a country in the, from the Eastern Hemisphere. Um, so that Monroe Doctrine thing seems to have worked out pretty well uh, from that perspective. So, why does America care so much? Well, Americans at the time believed, and many historians today believe, that one of France's motives in all of this was to seize control of Mexico and then use Mexico to supply and aid the Confederates in the Civil War. Now, this makes quite a bit of sense, actually. Um, in the early days of the Civil War, particularly before the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, Europe tended to favor the South. Uh, they had strong t uh, trade ties with the South. And, and probably more importantly, they really liked the idea of America splitting in half and having the two halves have to compete with, it, with each other, as opposed to it being one giant monolithic powerful state that they would have to compete with. Um, historians do disagree about whether France is going to do this, um, so I don't want to say that definitively. But I can say that in the 1860s, this is what Americans believed. So immediately after France is repelled, uh, or really even immediately after Cinco de Mayo, um, Americans will begin celebrating this because they see it as key, Northern Americans anyway, because they see it as key to their victory in the Civil War. And if you look at the timeline, this, this actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, the Battle of Puebla was on the 5th day of May uh, in 1862. Well, at this point, uh, Robert E. Lee particularly was enjoying a, an amazing string of victories uh, around uh, Virginia and D.C. and that, in that area. And if the French would have taken Mexico City, say, in the summer of 1862 and been, began supplying the Southern Army uh, immediately by, say, the fall of 1862, it's not that hard to imagine the South winning. Uh, by delaying the conquest of Mexico City by maybe as much as a year, you had time uh, for the Southern Army to begin to, to slow down its momentum. You'll see Lee repelled at Antietam, and of course in the summer of 1863, you'll see Vicksburg fall and uh, uh, Lee's defeat at Gettysburg. And so uh, we don't talk about a, lot this, a lot about this today, which is amazing considering how much we talk about the Civil War, uh, but Americans at the time celebrated Cinco de Mayo more than the Mexicans did. Uh, and, and I think that's probably still true today outside of Puebla. Um, and this is why. So I bet you didn't think Cinco de Mayo was an American holiday, but it was. Crazy, huh? Anyway, I'm Professor Rich. Uh, that was TYT History. Uh, thanks for listening.